how to stitch together countless tiny inertial patches to make a large smoothly undulating quilt of curved space-time. As Einstein began thinking about this, he remembered Gauss's theory of surfaces and realized that the foundations of geometry had physical significance. To pursue the problem further, he contacted his old friend and talented mathematician, Marcel Grossman. Einstein and Grossman had been students together in Zurich. When Einstein skipped classes, he'd often borrow Grossman's lecture notes. Now, with gravity and curved spacetime on his mind, Einstein once again turned for help to his trusty ally. Grossman told Einstein of Riemann's work and of a subject called tensor calculus, especially to contributions made in the 1860s by Elwin Christoffel, and more recently by Gregorio Ricci Cabastro and Tullio Levisavita at the University of Padova. Abruptly thrown into a new and difficult field of math of which he'd previously been unaware, Einstein wrote, In all my life I have not labored nearly so hard, and I have become imbued with great respect for mathematics. The subtler part of which I had in my simple-mindedness regarded as pure luxury until now. He had to learn about tensors mathematical objects that behave in certain well-defined ways when you switch coordinate systems. And soon it became clear to him that tensor calculus gave the perfect language for describing four-dimensional space-time. In 1913, Einstein and Grossman jointly published a paper in which they used the tensor calculus of Ricci Cabastro and Levi Civita to portray gravity in terms of a metric tensor, a tensor that gives a generalized way of measuring distance. But their theory was still far from complete. When Max Planck, the father of quantum mechanics, visited Einstein in 1913 and Einstein told him how things stood with his new scheme of gravity, Planck said, As an older friend, I must advise you against it, for in the first place you will not succeed and even if you succeed, no one will believe you. For a while, it looked as if Planck might be proved right. Not many scientists at the time thought Einstein was on the right track. Then, in October 1914, Einstein wrote a paper, nearly half of which was a treatise on tensors and differential geometry, the mathematics of surfaces. It proved to be a turning point because it led to a correspondence between Einstein and Levi Civita in which the Italian pointed out technical errors in Einstein's analysis of tensors. Einstein was delighted by the exchange, yet he continued to struggle with the equations that linked gravity with the geometry of space-time. At the end of June 1915, Einstein spent a week at the University of Göttingen, where he lectured for six two-hour sessions on his still incorrect October 1914 version of what would become general relativity. Two of those present were giants in the world of mathematics, David Hilbert and Felix Klein. Shortly after, Einstein and Hilbert began an exchange of letters on the outstanding problems in Einstein's theory, and now matters quickly came to a head. After chopping and changing the equations in his theory several times in the autumn of 1915, Einstein made a monumental breakthrough. On the 18th of November 1915, he applied his new theory of gravitation to the old problem of Mercury's orbit and lo and behold found that it predicted for the extra advance of the perihelion exactly the 43 arc seconds per century that astronomers had measured and that had foiled every other attempt at explanation. To Hilbert he wrote, Today I am presenting to the Prussian Academy a paper in which I derive quantitatively out of general relativity without any guiding hypothesis the perihelion motion of Mercury discovered by Leverrier. No gravitation theory had achieved this until now. 
The Mercury figure was correct, but not yet the precise formulation. On the 25th of November, Einstein submitted yet another paper called The Field Equations of Gravitation, which at last contained the correct mathematical scaffolding of general relativity. Aristotle saw gravity as a property of matter. Newton considered it a somewhat mysterious force. But in general relativity, it's neither of these things. Gravity in the brave new world of Einstein is a manifestation of curvature in the geometry of space-time. In many ways, general relativity turns our everyday notion of gravity on its head. Throw a ball straight up in the air, and a graph of its height versus time seen through Newton's eyes traces out a parabola. Einstein, however, recognizes that a massive body, in this case the Earth, curves the coordinate system itself. Rather than following a curved path in a flat coordinate system, the ball actually follows a minimum distance path or geodesic in a curved coordinate system, returning to the thrower's hand at a later time because the geodesic leads it there. This remarkable new view of things immediately removes two of the unanswered questions in Newtonian theory. How does gravity work? And why is the inertial mass of an object exactly equal to its gravitational mass? Einstein dismisses the first of these by showing that gravity isn't a force but simply a consequence of geometry. The second mystery also evaporates because in general relativity, gravitational motion is seen as being nothing other than inertial motion in curved space-time. In other words, the equivalence of inertial and gravitational mass, which under Newton appears to be a curious and accidental fact, is seen in general relativity to be a necessary and unavoidable feature of the theory. Though seemingly counterintuitive when first encountered, general relativity is a beautiful piece of work, mathematically and conceptually. But beauty alone isn't enough to ensure survival. The acid test of any good scientific theory is whether the predictions it makes are borne out by experiment and observation.